Last time we looked at the federal constitution's due process clauses as sources of procedural constraints on agency action. Now we widen our survey and take into view other, lesser sources. By lesser, I mean that constraints defined by these non-constitutional sources can be tightened or relaxed as Congress sees fit. Next in the hierarchy is the organic statute creating the agency and any amendments to that statute. We could also add here certain federal statutes, such as NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, that cut across the agencies and have procedural implications. Next in dignity is the Administrative Procedure Act, the APA itself. The APA applies to all federal agencies, with certain exceptions, but as to particular agencies, Congress is free to add to what the APA requires, or less commonly, to subtract. That is why the agency's organic statute controls when its requirements vary from those of the APA as to a certain agency. Next in descending order are the agency's own procedural regulations. Agencies are not free to subtract from what the Constitution, the APA, and applicable statutes require, but they often supplement these sources with their own procedural regulations. As we will see, agencies are assumed to be bound to follow their own regulations, procedural and otherwise. Last, and surprisingly perhaps least, is judicial common law. As we will see, the U.S. Supreme Court discourages judicial imposition of procedural constraints not anchored in the APA or some other superior source of procedural constraint. Last time, we encountered the distinction between adjudication and rulemaking, which has important consequences for the extent of due process procedural rights. We will see that the same distinction is the foundation of much of the APA. The APA Gateway Provision on Rulemaking is Section 553. The Gateway Provision on Adjudication is Section 554. The APA also gives its own definitions of the two. They are found in Section 551, Definitions. A rule is a statement having future effect. A rule making is the making, changing, or rescinding of a rule. No surprise here. An order is the final disposition of an agency in a matter other than rulemaking, but including licensing. To repeat, an order is a final disposition that is not a rule. This means that everything that is not a rule is an order. Finally, Adjudication means agency process for the formulation of an order. So every agency process is either a rulemaking or an adjudication. And every final disposition that is not a rule is an order. Adjudication functions as a residual catch-all. That means that some actions that don't much look like adjudications are counted as adjudications for APA purposes. An agency official sending a letter is an adjudication in this APA sense. And just to remove any possible doubt, licensing is an adjudication. Now, you might scratch your head at this. What if an order has future effect? Does that mean it's really a rule? And what if a general statement by an agency is presently in effect? Does that mean it's no longer a rule? You would be well advised to put these quibbles out of your head. Have confidence that you'll be able to correctly determine when an agency action is an adjudication or a rulemaking. When you say to yourself what Justice Potter Stewart once said, I know it when I see it. 
This table is one that we have seen before and will return to again. Every process leading to a final disposition in any agency matter falls within one and only one of the four squares. In three of the four squares, those containing the orange section numbers, detailed procedures are set out in the APA. In one of the squares, the informal adjudication square, the APA prescribes very little. Let's look more closely at what the detailed procedures involve. Under Section 553, Notice and Comment Rulemaking, notice in the Federal Register must be posted. The public must be given an opportunity for comment. The final rule, if any, must be accompanied by a statement of its basis and purpose. There must be a 30-day period to elapse before final rules become effective and the arbitrary or capricious standard review applies. Under sections 556 and 557, notice is given to interested parties. An impartial presiding official presides at a hearing. The presiding official is not to engage in ex parte contact with any party. The presiding official may issue subpoenas, may make evidentiary rulings, there will be oral testimony at a hearing. Cross-examination and rebuttal will be available to the parties. And a decision is to be made on an exclusive record. Also, judicial review is under the substantial evidence standard. As you can see, the agency has more procedural hoops it has to jump through if sections 556, 557 apply. Either way, Omission of any of the required elements engages the judicial review provision of the APA. The reviewing court shall hold unlawful and set aside agency action findings and conclusions found to be without observance of procedure required by law. We need now to appreciate how there can be interaction between different types of procedure. An adjudicative procedural right that would, one would otherwise enjoy can be erased if the agency has exercised rulemaking power in certain ways. Let's now look at the Storer Broadcasting case. Storer involves the Federal Communications Act, which gives the FCC both licensing and rulemaking powers. Recall that the APA states that licensing is an adjudicatory process. In Storer, the challenged agency action was the FCC's promulgation of a rule, one of whose provisions would authorize the denial of license applications without a statutory full hearing. The Federal Communications Act expressly provides that license applications are to be granted or denied only after a hearing to determine which action better advances the public interest, convenience, or necessity, the guiding intelligible principle in the Act. What had happened is that the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that modified its multiple ownership rule in a way that further limited concentration of media ownership. Storer already owned outlets in excess of what the modified rule would permit, and it, along with other broadcasters, objected to the FCC's tightening the multiple ownership rule. The FCC adopted the modified rule anyway and on its basis denied a store application already pending to license an additional outlet. The additional outlet would have been permissible under the prior rule and the application could only have been denied after hearing. But relying on its newly promulgated modified rule, the FCC denied the license application without a hearing. On its face, the application stated that Storer already owned more outlets in the Miami area than the new rule permitted. Storer sought judicial review of the rule, alleging that it was inconsistent with the hearing right the Act gives license applicants. The U.S. Supreme Court held for the FCC. The court wrote, 
We read the Act as providing a full hearing for applicants who have reached the existing limit of stations only upon their presentation of applications that set out adequate reasons why the rules should be waived or amended. We agree with the contention of the FCC that a full hearing would not be necessary on all such applications. The court thus appeared to endorse the FCC's argument that Storer was not entitled to a full hearing unless its application showed good enough reasons for waiving the modified multiple ownership rule. And if the FCC denied the petition for waiver, that denial would only be reviewable for arbitrariness or capriciousness. Storer would be entitled to a full hearing only if the denial was found arbitrary or capricious. And of course, once the rule itself survived arbitrary or capricious review, it would be unlikely that a reviewing court would hold that the denial of a petition for a waiver of the rule would be arbitrary or capricious. Query, if Storer applies for a waiver, does it get a full hearing on that issue? The answer is surely no. The Storer court recites and seems to endorse the FCC's position, which is that the mere filing of an application for a waiver would not necessarily require the holding of a hearing. For if that were the case, a rule would no longer be a rule. Rules will be rules, so to speak. Let's look at another case, National Petroleum Refiners Association versus FTC, also known as the Octane Posting case. In this case, the trade association plaintiff challenged the FTC's authority to issue regulatory rules. The rule at issue required gas stations to post the octane numbers of various grades of gasoline on each pump. The FTC was persuaded by consumer advocates like Ralph Nader that this information was less confusing than the trade names then in use. You are familiar with these octane numbers because the rule was upheld. The basis of the challenge was the argument that Congress intended the FTC to enforce the statutory standard only on a case-by-case -case basis in, inf in informal adjudicatory proceedings. The FTC had no power to bind any party who, until that party had been afforded a hearing on the issue whether the failure to post the octane numbers on each pump was an unfair or deceptive trade practice, which is the intelligible principle Congress set to guide the agency. Obviously, it would have been more time-consuming and costly for the FTC to proceed in this way. By laying down the octane posting rule through notice and comment rulemaking, the FTC could regulate much more efficiently. Which leads to a question. Why wouldn't the industry welcome agency rulemaking and pre-enforcement review? After Abbott Labs, the petroleum refiners would be entitled to pre-enforcement review of the validity of the octane posting rule. The member companies would not be in suspense or face a cruel dilemma like th that the drug companies complained about in Abbott Labs. The answer is that in neither case did the regulata regulated industry want the agency to have regulatory power at all. But if the courts hold that the agency does have the power to promulgate regulatory rules, then the regulated parties would prefer to have the option of seeking pre-enforcement review at a time and in a district of their own choosing. <laughs>